Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. And we now turn to the uh, Lorraine Hansberry text on summer, uh, on page uh, 455, 454, 455. However, before we get there, turn with me quickly in your hymnals to page 441. I just want to remind you at level 2B, I hope you have this information in your annotations, I just want to remind you that our focus now, as we are pairing up two titles, Celebration of Grandfathers is a text that I've done with you. Now we're going to look at on summer. And about both of these, we're looking at this thing under literary analysis topic, author's style. We're going to look at diction. We're going to look at syntax. We're going to look at tone. All of those we took a look at in our celebration of grandfathers. And now we're going to come back uh, to do that one more time with the Hansberry text. And under uh, reading skill, we're going to be understanding what the main idea or the central idea or the thesis is, as we sometimes refer to. Let's turn now to page 454 and notice that we're again working with the big question, the difference between knowledge and understanding or wisdom. The vocabulary words are there provided for you. Hey, make sure that you pay attention to those words, especially as we get ready for the examination assessment coming. Let's meet Lorraine Hansberry really quickly. See your dates there, 1930 to 1965. Unlike a number of our writers who lived a really long time, Notice the short period of time that she lived. Let's meet her really quickly. Lorraine Hansberry, I'm reading with you on 455. Lorraine Hansberry grew up on the south side of Chicago where her father prospered as a real estate broker. At the time, many white people closed their neighborhoods, refusing to sell or rent property to African Americans. Hansberry's father fought this practice, taking his case all the way to the Supreme Court where he won. And as well, we have put out that she's a pioneering playwright. As her father fought to integrate Chicago's neighborhoods, Hansberry laid claim to territories of the imagination. With the 1959 production of her play, A Raisin in the Sun, she became the first African-American woman to have a drama produced on Broadway. Raisin in the Sun is a really influential uh, text, and I would hope that maybe our study here of uh, this text would lead you uh, to that one. By the way, um, uh, Raisin in the Sun was resurrected again on, in 2004 as a, as a play that won some Tony Awards. You can read that at the bottom of 455. Here's the background for this essay, The Great Migration. Read it with me. Beginning in the early 1900s, hundreds of thousands of African Americans left the rural South for northern cities. They fled discrimination and the floods and pests that threatened their livelihood as farmers. Many left relatives behind and, like Hansberry's Chicago family, journeyed south in summertime to visit. So let's turn now to the text itself on 456. As we study this text, I'm going to ask you two things to write down that we're going to want to focus on. One, the first thing we want to ask about this text is, what is the central idea? What is the central thesis of this text? Like, what exactly is it that we're supposed to be working with? Okay, so that's the first thing that we want to play with. And the second thing that we want to mess around with here is to ask this question. What does summer, write this down, what does summer kind of symbolize in this essay? Okay, what does summer kind of symbolize in this work of nonfiction? All right, let's pay attention, follow along. Here we go, a very short reading, but I think a very compelling reading as well. Let's go to work. On Summer by Lorraine Hansberry. It has taken me a good number of years to come to any measure of respect for summer. I was, being May born, literally an infant of the spring, and during the later childhood years, tended, for some reason or other, to rather worship the cold aloofness of winter. The adolescence, admittedly lingering still, brought the traditional passionate commitment to melancholy autumn and all that. For the longest kind of time, I simply thought that summer was a mistake. In fact, my earliest memory of anything at all is of waking up in a darkened room where I had been put to bed for a nap on a summer's afternoon and feeling very, very hot. I acutely disliked the feeling then and retained the bias for years. It had originally been a matter of the heat, but over the years, I came actively to associate displeasure with most of the usually celebrated natural features and social byproducts of the season. The too grainy texture of sand, the too cold coldness of the various waters we constantly try to escape into, and the icky, perspiry feeling of bathing caps. It also seemed to me, aesthetically speaking, 
that nature had got inexcusably carried away on the summer question and let the whole thing get to be rather much. By duration alone, for instance, a summer's day seemed maddeningly excessive, an utter overstatement. Except for those few hours at either end of it, objects always appeared in too sharp a relief against backgrounds, shadows too pronounced and light too blinding. It always gave me the feeling of walking around in a motion picture which had been too artsily, craftsily exposed. Sound also had a way of coming to the ear without that muting influence, marvelously common to winter, across patios or beaches or through the woods. I suppose I found it too stark and yet too intimate a season. My childhood South Side summers were the ordinary city kind, full of the street games, which the other rememberers have turned into fine ballets these days, and rhymes that anticipated what some people insist on calling modern poetry. Oh, Mary, Mac, 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 with the silver buttons, 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 all down her back, back, back. She asked her mother, 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 for 15 cents, 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 to see the elephant, 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 jump, the fence, fence, fence. Well, he jumped so high, 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 till he touched the sky, sky, sky. And he didn't come back, 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 till the 4th of July, lie, lie. Evenings were spent mainly on the back porches where screen doors slammed in the darkness with those really very special summertime sounds. And sometimes, when Chicago nights got too steamy, the whole family got into the car and went to the park and slept out in the open on blankets. Those were, of course, the best times of all because the grown-ups were invariably reminded of having been children in rural parts of the country and told the best stories then. And it was all so cool and sweet to be on the grass and there was usually the scent of freshly cut lemons or melons in the air. And Daddy would lie on his back as fathers must, and explain about how men thought the stars above us came to be, and how far away they were. I never did learn to believe that anything could be as far away as that, especially the stars. My mother first took us south to visit her Tennessee birthplace one summer, when I was seven or eight, I think. I woke up on the back seat of the car while we were still driving through some place called Kentucky, and my mother was pointing out to the beautiful hills on both sides of the highway and telling my brothers and my sister about how her father had run away and hidden from his master in those very hills when he was a little boy. She said that his mother had wandered among the wooded slopes in the moonlight and left food for him in secret places. They were very beautiful hills and I looked out at them for miles and miles after that wondering who and what a master might be. I first saw my grandmother rocking away on her porch. All my life I had heard that she was a great beauty, and no one had ever remarked that they meant a half century before. The woman that I met was as wrinkled as a prune and could hardly hear and barely see and always seemed to be thinking of other times. But she could still rock and talk and even make wonderful cupcakes, which were like cornbread, only sweet. She was captivated by automobiles, and even though it was well into the 30s, I don't think she had ever been in one before we came down and took her driving. She was a little afraid of them and could not seem to negotiate the windows, but she loved driving. She died the next summer, and that is all that I remember about her except that she was born in slavery and had memories of it, and they didn't sound anything like gone with the wind. Like everyone else, I have spent whole or bits of summers in many different kinds of places since then, camps and resorts in the Middle West and New York State, on an island in a tiny Mexican village, Cape Cod, perched atop the Truro Bluffs at Long Nook Beach that Millet wrote about, or simply strolling the streets of Provincetown before the hours when the parties begin. And lastly, 
I do not think that I will forget days spent a few summers ago at a beautiful lodge built right into the rocky cliffs of a bay on the main coast. We met a woman there who had lived a purposeful and courageous life and who was then dying of cancer. She had, characteristically, just written a book and taken up painting. She had also been of radical viewpoint all her life. One of those people who energetically believe that the world can be changed for the better and spend their lives trying to do just that. And that was the way she thought of cancer. She absolutely refused to award it the stature of tragedy, a devastating instance of the brooding doom and inexplicability of the absurdity of human destiny, etc., etc. The kind of characterization given lately, as we all know, to far less formidable foes in life than cancer. But for this remarkable woman, it was a matter of nature in imperfection, implying, as always, work for man to do. It was an enemy, but a palpable one with shape and effect and source. And if it existed, it could be destroyed. She saluted it accordingly, without despondency, but with a lively, beautiful, and delightful ribald anger. There was one thing she felt which would prove equal to its relentless ravages, and that was the genius of man. Not his mysticism, but man with tubes and slides, and the stubborn human notion that the stars are very much within our reach. The last time I saw her, she was sitting surrounded by her paintings, with her manuscript laid out for me to read, because she said she wanted to know what a young person would think of her thinking. One must always keep up with what young people thought about things, because after all, they were change. Every now and then her jaw set in anger, as we spoke of things people should be angry about. And then, for relief, she would look out at the lovely bay at a mellow sunset settling on the water. Her face softened with love of all that beauty, and watching her, I wished with all my power what I knew that she was wishing, that she might live to see at least one more summer. Through her eyes, I finally gained the sense of what it might mean, more than the coming autumn with its pretentious melancholy, more than an austere and silent winter, which must shut dying people in for precious months, more even than the frivolous spring, too full of too many false promises, would be the gift of another summer, with its stark and intimate assertion of neither birth nor death, but life at the apex, with the gentlest nights, and above all, the longest days. I heard later that she did live to see another summer, and I have retained my respect for the noblest of the seasons. All right, let's turn now to this text and pay some attention to the genius way that this text is set up. This is a really pretty complicated essay once we start peeling back the surface level, what we call the epidermal level. Let's pay attention to the way she does it. Notice that she begins with childhood and ends with the death of an older person who is dying of cancer. Notice that she begins by saying that summer for her was never really that great of a season. She preferred maybe spring or winter to summer. But by the end of the essay, she's calling it the noblest of the seasons. But the reason she gets there, and this will sound very much like our celebration of grandfathers, is because she met somebody who taught her about not just seasons, but about the seasons of life. That is an interesting question to ask. If you see your life as your birth in the spring, your growing up in the summer, your aging in the autumn, your death in the winter, then what part of the year of your life are you in? Well, our natural inclinations are to say, because we're young, well, I'm in the spring of my life. And this woman at the end of our text will remind us, you know, if something like cancer comes along, the winter may come earlier than you expect. How will you address that season? That's, of course, where we're headed with this essay. Let's turn now to look at the essay itself quickly, starting on page uh, 456. We, of course, have 
her observation, I'm not sure I always had the proper respect for summer, she says. I was maybe more into melancholy autumn and, of course, the aloofness of winter, she says. And then she begins with earliest memories. Let's write this down. This will be an essay where she reflects on some important memories. You'll notice how she plays that game. I remember, blah, 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 blah. I remember, blah, 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 blah. But about each one of these remembrances, let's put this in our notes, she's moving from knowledge to understanding. Uh, wisdom. In other words, she finds wisdom by reflecting on her understandings of how she relates to the different seasons, especially to summer, right? Notice the repetition on 457. Notice the repetition of T-O-O, -O, right? I came actively to associate displeasure with most of the usually celebrated natural features and social byproducts of the season, the too grainy texture of sand, the too cold coldness of the various waters, uh, down into the next uh, paragraph, um, to uh, the shadows too pronounced, the light too blinding, and then on down a little bit further. I suppose I found it too stark and yet too intimate a season. Jot down in your notes this repetition of words. What's going on here? Well, again, there's repetition allows for a certain kind of like cataloging, right, of the ideas that she's presenting. Why did I not like summer? It was too much of this, too much of this, too much of this. Of course, this is the way young people think. Uh, this is going to be an essay about youth and old age and the, or, or, or aging and the ways in which young people often will make opinions about things too quickly to continue with the T-O-O -O word. She, of course, will make the observation that in her youth, one of the memories that she has about the summer is the time when children are jump roping and they're creating poetry. Let's put it in our notes this way. She's making a very subtle observation that the season, especially of summer, gives rise to artistic expression. Of course, we're going to meet an artist here in a little bit, aren't we? Right? Later in her life, we're going to meet an artist about, as well, these lines of poetry. Because I've had freshmen that say, I just don't get it. Like, what's up with quoting the poetry that's really just kind of repetition upon repetition of what children do? Well, children play. And here in a little bit, we're going to learn when she heads down south that she comes from a family that has in her history a runaway slave. Of course, she will say, I don't even understand what you mean. What is a master? Children jumping rope in the summer and report and, and, and jumping with these words. They have no sense, that is to say, of the heritage that came before them and the tragedies of that heritage sometimes. Right? She does report that she enjoys the memory of sleeping in the park when it got so hot. Of course, some of us today will say, well, why didn't they just turn on the air conditioning? And again, we're getting an observation here about you don't have maybe um, those kinds of opportunities in an earlier time. You had to be you had to be more resourceful. What would you do if it was really, really hot? Well, you went outside and you slept, right? And some of you maybe have stories like this. I had a freshman that said, my great-grandma used to talk about before she died when they were young, they didn't have even fans. So in the summer when it got really hot, everybody moved their beds outside. And you literally slept outside of the house and then in the morning, you moved your bed back inside of the house so that you could actually get some sleep because it was just so hot inside of the house. Hmm. These stories, of course, tie us again to the idea of legacy, don't they? Of course, legacy is the central key. Notice this. She talks about what was greatest about being in the nighttime in the park sleeping was, of course, the adults would begin to tell the stories. The best stories would be told. Then she goes to her visit to Tennessee traveling through Kentucky and being told that in her family there was a runaway slave who went away from the master. But the compelling line on 458 is that last line. They were beautiful hills and I looked out at them for miles and miles after that wondering who and what a master might be. The ways in which children receive gifts. This word gifts comes up in this essay. From the older. But we don't understand them as gifts. There were things that the old-timers went through, horrifying things that the old-timers went through, to give us what? Well, the ability to jump rope in the street and make up little poems and ditties. We don't have the ability always to fully appreciate all of the sacrifices that were made by those who came before. And here, of course, at 3A, let's jump to it already. We're joining, of course, the text that we've already studied, a celebration of grandfathers, aren't we, right? 
she points out as well that the um, that she also has a grandmother in her life, right? Notice she co she points out wrinkled, talks about the past and what it was like into the 30s. Never had driven in an automobile very much. Born in slavery and had memories of it that didn't sound anything like the text Gone with the Wind, which is, of course, any historian will tell us, one of those classic texts that's highly celebrated, but completely tells a different, really a different story of the South during the American Civil War, right? So there's another subtle kind of artistic observation there. Life in art is not always what life in real life was all about. But then she comes back to this notion of how as she got older, she started to spend her summers. And lastly, she says, she wants to tell a story about a woman she met on the main coast there, a dying woman, a powerful model, a woman who is dying of cancer. Her, her writing here, um, Hansberry's writing here is the most brilliant. Look at it again with me on page 459. When I do what I call close, C-L-O-S-E, reading with you, we read every word, but I try and point out the ways in which we might have missed a few things. For example, diction alone. Listen to the beautiful, melodic way that she writes at, on page 459. She had also been of radical viewpoint all of her life. Semicolon. One of those people who energetically believe that the world can, italicized, be changed for the better and spend their lives trying to do just that. And that was the way she thought of cancer. Semicolon. She absolutely refused to award it the stature of tragedy, comma, a devastating instance of the brooding doom and inexplicability of the absurdity of human destiny, comma, et cetera, et cetera. The kind of characterization given lately, as we all know, to far less formidable foes in life than cancer. A beautifully melodic way of saying this was a woman who understood that the cancer she